welcome to SVG TV News for Wednesday, March 27, 2024. I am Rochelle Batiste with the details. The new Sandals Resort is said to be driving airlines to increase international flights into St. Vincent and the Grenadines, with daily flights expected from American Airlines by the end of this year. This is according to Executive Chairman of Sandals Resorts International, Adam Stewart, speaking at today's ribbon-cutting ceremony for the five-star resort at the Bookerman, which signals the start of its business operation. The brand St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the international marketplace more than 10 billion times, 10 billion media impressions. You will see your magnificent island on the biggest networks, on national television and across the internet. Our team will drive demand in the international marketplace. And the partnerships that grow out of that look like this. American Airlines used to fly here two days a week. As of April, they fly four days a week. As of November, loaded in the system last like Saturday, they fly six days a week. But even better than that, and Gary Sadler holds these relationships close and near and dear to him. American Airlines called us two days ago to say that they will be flying to St. Vincent and the Grenadines daily by the end of this year. <laughs> Minister, you've been a pleasure to work with in getting and seeing this done. JetBlue will fly to this destination for the first time. United Airlines will fly to this destination for the first time. Air Canada is going to double what they're doing, and that's just the beginning. Virgin has already increased airlift, and all tides will rise with the sandals effect. It will give nationals the opportunity to fly more conveniently to anywhere they want in the world. It will allow visitors to, ac to access this. Stewart said the country's tourism and hospitality sector will benefit directly as the partnership between sandals and the government proved to be a worthy one. We're going to blow them away of the design of what we've created here. And we're going to take them right down deep into the Grenadines and show them Myru, Kanawan, you name it, Union Island, each and every one of them. So that they go back and they start telling their customers that there is a gem. A gem in the Caribbean that we are going to produce and funnel people in here. The reality, Prime Minister, is that all of this marketing and activity that we create will not all come to sandals, and we love that. Different strokes for different folks. There are boutiques down in Canawan that I visited two weekends ago. I hope they get a lot of business. There are boutiques here on Villas, on St. Vincent. I hope they get a lot of business. I hope everyone's rates rise. I hope people employ more. I hope everyone pulls up their socks and trains to show that what is of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is absolutely and completely world-class. And Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez noted that Sandals started its construction phase in SVG at a difficult time during the COVID-19 pandemic and delivered as promised in a timely manner. He said the boost of economic growth is welcome. The construction began, and to recap, we are now in the first part we are now just in the third month of 2024. But the actual construction here began in September 2022. When I was told what they were going to do, and they expanded that they're going to finish it around this time, I told Camillo, this thing is not believable. But when I got the reports, I even got more ambitious. I said, well, maybe they can host SILAC. And Prime Minister Gonzalez added that there are many opportunities for Vincentians with the opening of Sandals Resort. Indeed, I had to make the simple point. The sooner the hotel is finished, the quicker we will have people permanently employed, that the farmers and fishers would be able to sell their products, 
that the entertainers will be employed, that the tour operators will get business, and that the government will get the 11% VAT, because 11% of zero is zero. I can only get 11% of something when the something is taking place. I know everybody knows me in the Caribbean that I am a socialist, but I am a socialist who understands life, living, production, and money. There's this belief that socialists don't understand money. The 600 people who are working here right now understand that, what I'm talking about. Some of the dignitaries at today's ribbon cutting ceremony were members of cabinet, Governor General Dame Susan Duggan, and opposition leader Dr. Godwin Friday. A first paying guests also attended the event. They were all given a tour of the resort in number of incensions who were trained at other Sandals Resort across the region have returned home to take up job at the Sandals Resort SVG. Few of the villas at the resort are yet to be completed, as well as landscaping. The resort has 301 rooms, including of villas and luxury suites. In other local news now, we hear that officer in charge of the operation of the Argyle International Airport, the AIA, Josette Graves, has expressed surprise and disappointment at a planned industrial action by members of the Public Service Union. In a news release today, Graves stated that they had written the union on February 16, 2024, explaining their position on retroactive payments for staff but never received an acknowledgement of correspondence. They are now inviting the PSU to meet with them next month to discuss the retroactive payments, which was outlined in the correspondence. Graves claimed that despite the union's breach of the collective bargaining agreement signed in 2020, they are willing to engage the union's leadership on the matter. The PSU said that the retroact retroactive payments were not made for 2019, 2022, 2021, and 2023. The AIA has overpaid the 1.5 retroactive increment for 2016 to 2018. Meanwhile, on radio today, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez says he is hoping that good sense prevails and that the workers at the Argyle International Airport, who are members of the Public Service Union, the PSU, uh, do not allow any political-inspired union leadership to take them off course, noting that the airport is an enterprise which embodies the nation and that he wants reasonableness and good sense to prevail. President of the PSU, Elroy Boucher, told Astro TV News yesterday that they have already served notice to the management of the AIA that if their members are not paid the retroactive increments owed to them within the next two weeks' time, they will engage in industrial action as they have been engaged in the management of the AIA on the matter for four years now and it is yet to be settled. The curtains came down on the Heritage Month activities with a lecture delivered last evening by historian and author Dr. Adrian Fraser. The lecture hosted by the UWI Global Campus was on the topic National Hero and Heroes Day, Meaning and Significance, What's Next? In his delivery on the topic, Dr. Fraser noted that National Heroes Day, which was celebrated for the first time on March 14, 2001, as a holiday uh, this the year before Joseph Chatier was officially declared the first national hero of SVG was part of the process of reclaiming our history of providing us with our own heroes. I am guided on this by an African proverb. Until lions have their own historians, tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter. Now many of us, the older ones, would remember going to matinee and um, looking at Tarzan and, and um, looking at cowboy movies where the cowboys were dealing with the Indians. And uh, so there were all of those negative images. And when you look back and you imagine the indigenous people having to face that, that kind of thing. Now Charles Shepard, who wrote on behalf of the British planters and others who had participated in the struggles between the British and the indigenous people, the Garifuna, declared Chateauier ruthless and sanguinary. Cruelty rather than courage had been his trademark. 
How then did this villain, as the British described him, rise to become the national hero of an independent St. Vincent and the Grenadines? As we reflect on this, the period of the 1960s to 1980s stand out. Those were the years associated with the Black Power movement and with the movement towards decolonization and independence when ideas were floating around, people were free to discuss and to think about what lay ahead. Dr. Fraser said he felt the National Youth Council has not been given credit for the work it did in having Joseph Chateau declared a national hero. By 2002, everybody accepted that there was only going to be one national hero and that was Chateau, and the work of the National Youth Council was important. On March 1985, the obelisk at Dorset Hill was unveiled by Minister of Culture John Horn, who gave the feature address. <coughs> Junior Bacchus of the National Youth Council chaired that event. The government of Venezuela provided the plaque for the obelisk. Promise then was made to have a statue of Chatelier to be erected, it was said, on some conspicuous place in Kingston. And the Venezuelan government was to assist in its production. That has so far never uh, bore fruit. Now, the re lane ceremonies are the obelisk, which we have now regularly. The National Youth Council have been doing that for over 10 years before Shati was a national hero. And that is why I said they have never really been given credit for what they did. And I could see this because I participated in a lot of activities. Um, a number of years I've gone to, particularly to Sandy Bay, to speak to the people there at the old school. And uh, I think I went to Greg's at least once or twice. So Chate was by that time, even before 2002, acclaimed as national hero by the people of the country. The acquisition of Balasso and turning it into a cultural historic memorial site will be transformative for the cultural heritage landscape of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This is according to lawyer and chair of the National Trust Heritage Fund, Louise Mitchell. Because what happened was a form of genocide on Balasso. Um, there was the killing of such a substantial amount of a particular race. The intention was to eliminate them, um, extirpate them is what the British said. And genocide is all about erasing, cult uh, erasing culture, erasing memory, and, and putting the Garifuna so far away that there'd be no trace. So actually declaring this as protected heritage or acquiring the land it is basically bringing back alive and something that the British tried to absolutely kill and eradicate. This is us saying that our culture is going to be alive. It has survived um, thanks to the persistence of the Garifuna in Belize, Honduras, etc. It has, the culture has indeed survived. Genocide was committed. There was an attempt to get rid of the language, the people. The language is still alive. So this would be a huge step in the direction of saying nobody can ever get rid of this culture, that it's here forever. Our cultural heritage is something that we're going to hold on to and fight for as fiercely as the Caribs had fought for St. Vincent for so many years. So this is us 227 years later saying we are now standing up for our history and not allowing anything else to come and trample on it. So it's incredibly important that we take this step. Mitchell was asked on the program whether there is any move by her organization to make Balasso a UNESCO heritage site. She explained that the National Trust was part of an effort back in 2012 and was successful in getting three different cultural or natural sites, including the Grenadine Islands Group, which Balasso is a part of, on the short list of the UNESCO World Heritage Site did on the UNESCO World Heritage Site short list. This is not the same as being finally listed mm -hmm. as a heritage, but this is a step towards right. it. So um, the, the sites that were listed based on the recommendation of the National Trust were La Soufriere National Park, 
the Rock Arts of St. Vincent and the Grenadines Island Group. So the Grenadines Island Group is 35 islands including Karakou and there's support for this nomination by Grenada as well and it includes Baliso. Baliso is one of the islands and if you go to the UNESCO site and you look up Grenadine Islands Group it speaks about one of the reasons why this should be protected is because of the special history of Baliso. It speaks about Baliso as a place of memory for the indigenous people and because it speaks about the genocide. So a critical reason why the Grenadine Islands Group should be declared on UNESCO is because of that history, the Baliso history. So it is captured there, but, um, but Baliso is part of a larger grouping that we were seeking because there are many things about the Grenadines that are special, um, including the big drum dance in Union Island, the fact that the Union Island gecko is found only one place in the world. So there are many things about it that come together to make the Grenadine Islands Group as a site for shortlisting on the UNESCO World Heritage Site. But what is important is that UNESCO is an international body. And for us to achieve actual listing on UNESCO um, list. It takes many states around, many countries around the world. So, and for us to get that, UNESCO also looks at what protection are you doing na nationally first. Mm -hmm. So wh while we wait on UNESCO to give us a designation, we need to take need steps to here, here which, which are the <coughs> steps that we can control. So this we must move ahead with. We must move, mm -hmm. okay. With 2,000 people reportedly dying on Baliso within a four month period. Historian Dr. Arnold Thomas said there are signs of mass graves on the island and something will have to be done about it. I know. Louise, we'll have to bring in the archaeologists again. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, when I made the recommendation. Sorry, Mr. Thomas, we get back here. Yeah. When I made the, um, the call over 10 years ago for Baliso to be made a protected national heritage site, I also called for there to be an excavation there because absolutely, I mean, we need to have more information. Yep. I mean, over the years growing up, I would have heard about the discovery of skulls in Bali, so I'd heard that, you know, throughout my childhood, but, um, you know, there's never been a proper um, archaeological excavation done. Mm -hmm. They're looking yeah. at this particular history. So that is one of the first things and I would say bef even before any monument or anything is put up there and as council was saying how any type of development has to be very sensitive to the historical memory and I would say before that begins uh, there should be an archaeological excavation yeah. done mm -hmm. so that we get an idea as to okay um, where the camps were you know yeah uh, when we did excavations in Argyle, you would recall, Jennifer, you were present that many shallow graves mm -hmm. were, were found yeah. um, because the Amerindians buried um, their family members in shallow graves. But again, how did the British treat, you know, and how yeah. did the British deal with them? Did they also use shallow graves or just mass graves, most likely? And of course, there was a major plague that happened on, on Bali, so where many would have died. Um, you know, at one time. Right. So, and the folks yes. are calling for a proper burial to put the bodies to rest. Absolutely. Lawyer and politician Luke Brown is appealing to business entities across St. Vincent and Grenadines not to let the digitization wagon pass them by. Uh, Brown, who was speaking on a number of topics on the ULP Speaks program, last evening advised local businesses to digitize their records and other important documents, noting that paper records will eventually become obsolete. We, we have to really do whatever we could to move to a paperless state of existence, whatever is required. We have to do it because paper is going to be obsolete just now. Invest in the digitization of your records and have a computer-based operation as far as possible. I mean, working and making sure that you have backup in place as may be necessary, but do not let the digitization wagon pass you by. And this... Brownfield expressed his contentment with the government's digitization efforts, adding that there are a number of errors that will greatly benefit from a digitization uh, push. Brings me to, um, to the point, or to making the point, that I'm very happy 
with some of what is taking place with the government right now in terms of digitization and the digitization trust because I know from my practice of law that there are areas including areas related to the registry that need to benefit from uh, a digitization impetus and we, uh, we've we had some areas that have already uh, received that kind of push including matters to do with the filing of claims and uh, the, the processes associated with it and the court and whatnot and I'm happy about that. A new team has been piloted by the World Pediatric Project, the WPP, namely its first pediatric pulmonology clinic. The WPP says the new diagnostic team specializes in identifying and treating children with chronic lung and respiratory conditions and concerns. Some of these include conditions such as chronic asthma, pneumonia and bronchitis. The team held clinic for three days from March 10 to the 12th at the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital, seeing a total of 103 children, one being born just a few days prior to the clinic. Uh, this two-man team was made up of Dr. Michael Schichta, who was the lead physician, and Sasha Gay Overstreet, the registered nurse. They were assisted throughout the clinic by local pediatric physician, Dr. Joy Walters, and pediatric general surgeon, Dr. Jasmine Davy Ellis. Of the children that were seen, the WPP cells, a few of them were original families who came to St. Vincent to be evaluated. Four were from St. Lucia and one from Barbados. The WPP cells team was excited to come to St. Vincent for the first time to evaluate the children and believe that the trip was worthwhile. <laughs> Police are investigating another homicide here, this time in South Rivers. The deceased has been identified as Clinton Hackshaw, who, according to reports, was found on Tuesday night lining the road leading to Barra with what appeared to be multiple gunshot injuries to his back. Hackshaw's death brings to 10 the number of homicides for the year thus far. On the radio today, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonsalves, who is a representative, described Hackshaw as a gentle human being and that he do not know why someone would want to kill him. This man is so quiet. Mm -hmm. and he's hard working. He has a daughter who goes to school at the George Stevens Secondary in Gunnery. You can expect him at the Parent Teachers Association meeting. You see the kind of man I tell you about. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I had a conversation with the Commissioner of Police this morning on the matter. I wouldn't say anything more than that. And <clears throat> the people in South of us are enraged about this matter. It has hit them to their beings. Mm -hmm. This is not the sort of a thing which happens up there. A community which is very community spirited. Mm -hmm. And I hope <laughs> the police gets to the bottom of this fairly quickly. There is a small minority of wicked, evil people, tiny minority. And the various communities know them, you know. Mm. Huh? The communities have to respond and help the police. Yeah. We have to fight together this kind of monstrosity mm. by a tiny minority, a tiny group of persons, they will not succeed in their quest for lawlessness. Too many of us are right thinking and decent and law abiding, steeped in the requisite values to uplift our civilization. The Prime Minister noted that they will be going to Parliament next week, Thursday, April 4, 2024, to increase the penalties in respect to the illegal possession of firearms and ammunition and creating some new offences. I want those who have firearms to listen to me. I want the mothers who know that, and grandmothers and uncles and fathers who may know that their sons have guns, illegal guns. Turn them in, there's an amnesty. Hmm. Because this law will come into being as the amnesty comes to an end. So when somebody gets 18 months now for illegal possession of a firearm. I complain. <laughs> and after the law comes in, they get four years. Or if they get three years now, they get six years then. Don't complain.
you're getting a chance to take it in. I make the point over and over again. When you involve in these kinds of violent criminal actions, you're either going to end up in jail, or you yourself end up dead. Or you go to jail and then you get dead. And more than likely, sooner rather than later. That is the, I don't know what is so difficult for some people to understand, you know. I, I know that some young males who turn to violence are seeking to be somebody, seeking to be a person, mm -hmm. because they may have inadequacies in themselves as persons, seeking to be somebody. But you don't have to seek to be somebody with a gun mm -hmm. or a knife or a cutlass. No. Seek to be somebody with training and education and the opportunities are huge. Just have the discipline. You can be somebody by working hard and smart, not by getting involved in criminal activities and be greedy and you get involved in it mm -hmm. and you think you're a bad man. You're a bad man to damnation. That's where you're going. That's where you're going. An update now on the killing of Kamisha Haynes. The police say post-mortem examination conducted on the body of the 17-year-old on Tuesday, March 26, 2024, listed the cause of death as strangulation. Haynes, a 17-year-old domestic worker of Maurice Village, was discovered by residents in an area known as Wim Road in Belmont, Marico, on Sunday, March 24th. The police say they are following several leads to ascertain the facts and circumstances surrounding the incident. Anyone with information that can assist with the investigation and of other crimes is encouraged to contact the Criminal Investigations Department at Calico at 1784-458-4200 or call the emergency numbers 999-911. The police say all calls will be treated confidentially. A mechanic was killed in a motor vehicle accident in Rose Hall around 1 a.m. today. According to reports, Kellon Sapleton, better known as as Creech succumbed to injuries sustained when the vehicle he was driving overturned in the North Leeward area. Another person who was said to be inside the vehicle was injured in the incident and is said to be hospitalized. In other police news now, we hear that the police has arrested and charged Collins James, a 52-year-old unemployed of Diamond for the offense of a bigamy. The police say, according to investigations, the accused allegedly did an act to the commission of the offense by arranging a wedding ceremony between himself and a 50-year-old nurse of Glen or New York. The offense was committed on February 7, 2024 at 12.50 p.m. in Glen. James appeared at the Kingston Magistrate Court today where he pleaded not guilty to the charge. He was granted bail in the sum of 3,000 EC dollars with one surety and no contact to the complainant. He was further ordered to report at the Stubbs Police Station every Monday between 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. The matter was adjourned to and transferred to the Calico Court for hearing on April 2, 2024. In other local news now, we hear that Dean Otis Nicholson of the St. George's Cathedral has stressed the importance of prayers and fasting during the Lenten period. Discussing the significance of Easter on NBC Radio yesterday, Dean Nichols said when a person fasts, they must not do so as a way of showing off, but it must be done to connect with God. Traditionally and currently, we still encourage persons to fast, especially on Ash Wednesday. And here, fasting is understood to be um, between the hours of 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. It can mean a liquid diet throughout the day or one meal for, for the day. But I know that there are persons who basically um, do liquid diets. Um, the idea behind it is to really show our dependence on God, our trust in God, to sustain us throughout that period. Right, so there are persons who, um, who will, will add, um, reading the scriptures, so some persons might make it their, their desire to read the whole of Genesis for, for this period, or read a chapter per day. You know, as, as an additional to their usual morning devotions or evening devotions.
Um, but in the, in the book of Isaiah, there are, there are particular understanding as well of fasting. In as much as it is a spiritual, a good spiritual exercise, it must not become an end in itself. Dean Nichols also spoke of the importance of not eating meat and attitudinal changes during the Holy Week. Especially um, meat with, with, with blood. Mm -hmm. To speak of the bloodless sacrifice of our Lord Jesus over against the sacrifice that would have been done um, under the Jewish rites where they would have offered goats and sheep and bulls as their sacrifice where the essence of that was blood. Right. So, yeah, so that is more, actually, that is more, more vital in terms of our attitudinal shifts. Um, so, for example, over the years, as an individual, um, I prefer to perhaps to take up something, um, to be more kind, to be gentler, to be calmer, you know, during this, this period. Um, rather than just to simply say, oh, I'm giving up chocolate, or I'm giving up alcohol, or I am not eating this, or I'm not eating that. You know, so, so, so those go more, those attitudinal changes go deeper and more reflects our um, sense of what God requires of us. Explaining the importance of the cross to Christians, Dean Nichols said it is essential symbol as a reminder of Jesus Christ who died for human sins. As when we when we combine that with the entering into that period of fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, it is a reminder to us as Christians that um, dust we are unto dust we shall return. And so it will, we would say, repent and believe the gospel. So you have that dual sense there. As we impose the cross, you have that dual sense. Ash Wednesday, on the other hand, is the communal get-together where persons as a community say, look, these are some of the things that we need to repent of. And the cross on the forehead and Wednesday we will burn them crush them and that will be where we'll get the ash to impose on persons on Ash Wednesday so it's about con continuity continuity mm -hmm. right where one symbolism of victory now becomes a symbolism of pain, sorrow, and the reminder for our own mortality.